Hi, everyone. Oh, where is the presenter? I'm changing a bit gears, but maybe this picture uh, looks a bit familiar to you. Um, that might be very well possible because before the break, uh, Matteo Marinelli already has shown that uh, picture of the iron trap. So I work in exactly the same experimental setup as Matteo Marinelli, but I'm going to show you totally different measurements uh, I'm doing with that setup. So my talk is only concerned with a single calcium um, 40 ion, and the complexity moves away from having multiple ions and manipulating them to um, preparing special state in the oscillatory motion in the trap of the ion. So I try to encode the cubing, qubit in this mechanical oscillator, and the code states um, I'm aiming for are the so-called grid states, or mo most of you might better know them as the um, GKP states, named after the three initials of the uh, three authors who have proposed that coding scheme. Um, they also address how to do fault-tolerant universal computing with like a quantum optics setup. I'm not going so far. I really just try to implement the code states and show some single qubit operations on them. Uh, and to remind you how this, oh, this is very poorly resolved on that beamer. There would be many more blobs in, in the directions. Um, how these code states roughly look, look like as a Wigner function in phase space, they have really this grid-like uh, nature and a lot of structure. To create and manipulate and read out these states, I use so-called modular position and momentum measurements. So what do I mean by that? I really mean take the position or the momentum operator modulo in the mathematical sense uh, some, some length scale. So position will not just increase to infinity, but is reset always after this characteristic, characteristic length scale. Um, a similar type of modularity we get by just plugging in these operators into tri trigonometric functions with some prefactors. We learned very early in our quantum mechanics courses that the position and momentum operator, no way that they ever uh, commute. But suddenly, these modular versions, they can actually commute, commute but it depends on their um, prefactors, on their length scales. So for some prefactors, they commute, while for others, they anti-commute. So first, I'm going to explain how really only the basics about the how I implement these modular measurements and especially sequences of them. Um, then we will experimentally explore uh, how we can see whether this momentum uh, and position can actually commute. And then I will quickly explore a, a third topic since I have a mechanical oscillator. So this is like the, the system with the most natural crossover to uh, classical physics. So I will also address how we can use this measurement to explore um, this, this quantum to classical transition. And then in the second part, we will use whatever uh, we learned here to, to get to some um, approximate grid states. So the experimental system, a single trapped calcium-40 ion, uh, we have two kind of degrees of freedom on one side the perfect harmonic motion in the trapping potential. On the other side, the internal states typically used as, as qubit. We now shift our perspective really on this motion and use the qubit as um, a way to manipulate the motion. Um, here now a more practical picture of how we can couple the, the two degrees with, with lasers. So if we shine the laser close to resonance with such a transition, um, we observe these spectrums and all these peaks correspond to frequencies where we can excite the internal states. Um, this big middle peak is what we call the carrier transition, which is excite uh, the internal state, and we don't do anything on this motional oscillator. At lower frequencies, we find the red sideband. Um, so when we excite the atom, we reduce the motional oscillator by a quanta, the analog on the other side of, uh, of the carrier, the blue sideband, uh, we excite the atom and um, add a quanta 
The rest of the peaks correspond to the red and the blue sidebands of the other two independent um, motional modes one single ion has. And you can nicely see I can choose here with my laser frequency with which mode I'm going to work. And the mode of interest is the axial motional mode, so along the trap axis, and I work at roughly 1.85 megahertz. We can not only um, manipulate this ion with just shining one frequency, so we can shine two, like us, which is also the same as in the mulmer sorensen gate. I'm now applying the red and the blue sideband on resonance, so that's the difference to the gate. Um, and so this leads to the evolution of the um, motion and the internal states of the atom given by a phase space displacement operator. But now I plugged in here as well uh, the sigma x operator acting on the internal qubit. So dependent on the internal state of the qubit, this displacement um, will act differently. What does this mean in practice? If we look at the ground state cooled oscillator here shown as a phase space cartoon and an ion in the down state. So to see what this, this state dependent force is doing, we can first observe that the down state is an equal superposition in the eigenbasis of the sigma x operator. And that means if we apply the state dependent force, our oscillator splits up into two parts. Um, entangled with these sigma x eigenstates. Um, we have done other work in the group um, using bichromatic laser fields and this is summarized in, some of this is summarized in these three papers. So we, we can control um, the, the size of the displacement via laser power and duration and we also have good control over the direction of this, this splitting via the relative laser phase of blue and um, red sideband. So we have seen in the other talks how we typically read out our iron qubits. So after we have done some manipulation on, on, on the transition, uh, we shine a laser coupling to a third level um, it, the ion gets excited, that's very short-lived, it decays, it emits a photon, uh, gets excited again and decays, and we collect all these, these photons. And the detection I'm using is, is summarized in this plot. So we have kind of two options. Either we detect photons, we see a bright spot on the camera, we know we must have been in this level, or we don't detect any photons, so we know we cannot been, have been in this down level, so conclusion is uh, we measure the up level. So if we do this many times, we get a histogram shown here in, in orange. To this histogram, one can very nicely fit a two Poisson distribution representing the statistics for those two kind of events. From this histogram, we can extract the threshold. And for every next detection, if we detect uh, less photons that, than the threshold, we say we measure this state the dark state, the up level, and if we have more, um, the down level. And for such a, such a single shot decision, the error here is uh, around 10 to the minus three. This error can easily be made much smaller by just extending the time window of detection. But what does this now mean to, for our emotional state after we, for example, have prepared this entangled uh, state between our emotional oscillator and the internal state? Um, so we have, we first can rewrite that state again in the, the basis of measurement, the up-down basis, and we see we have the up-down state entangled with what we call a cat state in an oscillator, a superposition of coherent states. If we now detect and we find the ion to be bright, um, then we would know that we projected in this odd cat state with the minus sign between, but unfortunately, scattering of photons um, leads to momentum kicks with each uh, scattering event, so we will not end up quite in this state. But this is very different if we don't detect any photons, um, we don't scatter anything, so we have nicely prepared this even cat state, um, so, and it's intact. And the best is we can actually go on with our experiment and do further things. For example, uh, last year, we have then done Wigner function tomography on these prepared cat states. So 
here one note about my cartoons. I'm just really drawing more or less the wave function where the parts are and not really the Wigner function. And here you see the, the Wigner function of this guy. Here are the, the two blobs and we nicely observe the, the interference uh, between them. What I told you so far can actually already be viewed as one of these modular um, position or momentum measurements. And for more theoretical people, I uh, redrawn the measurement in, in the circuit model here. Um, so if we just do state dependent force and the fluorescence detection, it's this circuit, but we don't have control over the phase phi here. And this final unitary is given by this um, displacement operator. And indeed, the measurement operator, viewing this as a measurement of the oscillator, uh, is given by the cosine of the uh, position and momentum operator with the prefactor, which we can control via our uh, displacement alpha. To have more, or um, so, how do we typically think about these measurements intuitively? If we do that circuit and we sweep the size of the alpha, um, what we observe is this decay curve, and this is simply when we pull apart the wave packet, um, it's showing how we lose the overlap of the, these two wave packet parts. To have more flexibility, I'm also implementing the same circuit, um, having control of, over this phase, um, and then the unitary is a one. So what does this mean? This, this second circuit has exactly the same measurement operator, it will also show the same probabilities if I do a single measurement, but what will be different is the post-measurement state. It will now be having a part at zero and a, a displaced part, and additionally I can control really the superposition phase of those two um, split up parts. So in case of a dark detection here, we can go on, we can take this post-measurement state feed it back into the circuit and go on with the measurement. By putting here a pi pulse and swapping the rows of the level, we can also project into the other uh, sign here. Um, and like that, we can really get the full statistics of a sequential measurement. So we can also put in more interesting states than the ground state, for example, already uh, some uh, superposition state. Since we want to look at the commutation of modular position and momentum, we can do a first measurement separating along uh, the position, then a second measurement, for example, now separating along the momentum. And we can now ask ourselves, does this second measurement care whether actually this first measurement um, is present? Um, to answer this experimentally, we have to try it out. We do a second measurement where we take directly the input state and measure along the direction of, of uh, momentum. If the statistics we find in this first measurement, uh, which I write as with bracket A to remember, I, I actually did measurement A before, which leads to this eight partite uh, superposition state, is the same as the statistics I find in the second measurement, then we call measurement A to be non-signaling in time to measurement B. And if they are different, um, we quantify this difference by look, just looking at the difference of the statistics. So do we know what's happening here? Do we have an intuition? The experiment is so simple that we can just analytically calculate what, sh what should go on and put some symbols in that the formula uh, doesn't get too long. It's always a question about um, overlap and geometric phases, what will, will be happening. So this first part here contains the, the big phase phi, and this is a geometric phase which arises because in the first measurement I'm displacing in another direction than in the second one. And I try to show these phases here uh, geometrically uh, pick, uh, in the picture. So we see if, if this part here um, is, is a zero, then we expect to be a, having a non-signaling in time measurement. So there are quite some phases involved in these protocols. Here, just a quick uh, summary, but don't worry, I just explain along the way. 
So we have like the phase giving the displacement in, in phase space. We have the phase giving the relative phase between superpositions. And now finally, we have also geometric phases turning up. And these are ac exactly my control knobs of these experiments. Then there is a second uh, symbol, this M, and I call this wave packet overlap. And it's just looking at how the input state overlaps with it, its displaced version. And for this measurement of non-signaling time, what matters is the displacement used in the second measurement. And we see for the state I'm plotting here, and this will also be the experiment I, I'm then performing. Um, looking at these pictures, we find no overlap because none of these black parts is actually overlapping. So to see, to explore uh, the dependence on the geometric phase, we need some overlap. So let's just put in this state. Okay. Then we have here some overlap. So we performed that experiment, and I vary the, the size of the displacement in the first measurement, and this is sweeping my geometric phase. And I can see a variation between maximal signaling here for this experiment and zero signaling at other phases or at other displacements. Since, and the, yeah, as expected. Since I like to look at whether modular position and momentum can actually commute, we need to think about what the sequential measurement tells us about this. So we have here now a very general measurement, so it's not a projective textbook measurement. So what is still valid is that if for all possible oscillator input st states, we would see the non-signaling in time, we would know that the observables um, commute. So I set myself uh, to non-signaling in in time settings. Uh, I choose alpha equals four, so in the, in the first measurement, the displacement of separation of four, and in the second measurement of pi, so roughly three. So since all input state is not so good for my experimental PhD, so I just take a sample. I again take uh, superpositions, um, but I vary the, the base state with which I do the superposition. So I take the ground state, but I also take a squeeze state, um, and I take the first fog state, the first excited state. And for each of them, I measure this, two sec this sequential measurement um, for 50 different orientations in, in phase, phase space. Then I gather all the, the values of the measured S, and I plot them here as a histogram in, in red. Um, I also show here a sample data set of the first excited state, and this is really the worst data set. So the other ones look nicer. Uh, you see the two experiments qualitatively agree, while in the longer sequence I already see some effects of the coherence. But I also chose quite some displacements, four and, and three in phase space. Um, here, looking at the histogram, we see the largest measured uh, difference was 0 0.087. And now the question is, what do we actually need to compare this histogram to? Be because I just told you if we have no overlap, we are anyway non-signaling in time. So I, for comparison, I, plot, I calculated what the histogram for these input states would look like um, if we have signaling in time settings and the exact sample of, of input state. And we, as expected, we see some proportion around zero. These are the states with no overlap. But we also have a proportion at 0 0.5, and that's the maximal signaling we expect. This shows we have these sequential measurements well under control up to, to the displacements uh, used. And we see qualitatively that they, they commute up to the level of signaling we can observe here. With this, I like to jump to the second topic, um, how to use these uh, modular measurements to distinguish whether my oscillator behaves quantum mechanically or not. This is more motivated by bigger mechanical oscillator systems like cantilevers and so on, where we are actually not sure uh, we reach the quantum regime. And I'm kind of testing ways with my better understood uh, system. So to address this question, we need to think about uh, what would be the, the classical analog of our modular measurement. And we, if we look again at the Hamiltonian, we see we had some Hamiltonian having the position operator uh, coupling to our internal uh, qubit. And so we can just 
the best semi-classical analog we can consider is just having a position uh, behaving classically or just some other noise field coupling to a qubit. And this Hamiltonian is very well studied. This is actually just a, a Ramsey measurement. So these modular measurements can be viewed as Ramsey measurements of coupling to a quantum field. We have seen um, that I can make these measurements signaling in time. Now we can think about the, the cap coupling to a classical field. And if we think about it, um, we measure this classical field once, we will not change, and I mean I put here magnetic noise because that's the most well known for the ion trap, we will not change our magnetic noise field by this first measurement, and this will not allow us to signal to measurement B. Of course, uh, this is only true if we do our Ramsey measurement uh, properly and don't do anything weird. Um, there is another well-known way of relating such sequential measurements. We can not only look whether they signal, but we can look how they are correlated. So we just add up whether the results are the same and subtract when the results are different. We know in classical uh, physics or classical Ramsey measurements, they can be correlated. We can even get more information about our noise. But also quantum mechanically, a sequential measurement can be correlated. So if we want to distinguish uh, this regime from this regime with correlators, we need to do a bit more work. We need to look at a sequence of three measurements, and that's which is covered in the so-called legged garg inequality. So we need to look at the sequence of three measurements in time and measure always the correlator be between each pair. Then the, the quantum oscillator is able to violate this inequality, while the classical noise field would not be able. Um, there was a protocol um, proposed in this paper here using really the modular measurements I, I just presented. So uh, I guess I skip over. This is a measurement of some time correlator. So I, I tested this uh, legged garg inequality with uh, my ion for different sizes of displacement uh, in my measurements and for three different initial temperatures of, of the oscillator, and everything above one is a, is a violation. Um, and you can see I can violate it over a fairly large range of displacements, up to like three. This sharp cutoff here is really given by motional dephasing, so the, the solid lines are simulations of the expected uh, dephasing I have in, in, in my setup while the dashed line would be the ideal experiment in this case. And actually the conclusion from this simple test of that scheme was that this experiment I found pretty hard to do in, in my well understood system. And I really think uh, we need more clever scheme for, for system we don't know so well. Maybe the signaling in time might be easier since it just involves two times. But also there you need this to have this overlap, um, which is not trivial. To, to get. So with this, I now finally like to jump to, to the um, generation of the GKP states. I just wanted to give you also some background about the, the measurements. So what do these code states look like? They can be described in the stabilizer formalism, uh, picking two displacement operators um, as the stabilizer operators. And the easiest is just to pick them um, in orthogonal directions along the momentum and the position axis. So the code states will be um, eigenstates of these operators. So how does an eigenstate look like um, of two displacement operators? Um, so to be in an eigenstate of the displacement, for example, along momentum, we can just pick a position eigenstate, for example, x equals zero, so an infinitely squeezed state along this uh, momentum axis. But then to be also in an eigenstate of, of the displacement along the x-axis, we need to take copies of this x eigenstate at um, x equals l, 2l, and so on, and in both directions. So we will end up with uh, infinitely many, infinitely squeezed states. Um, shifting this whole state by half the periodicity, we get uh, the other logical state, the one state. So again. Um, this is not a state I'm going to prepare in, in my PhD, but fortunately people have looked into approximate versions of this and this is simply um, 
taking finite squeezing and a finite sum, and one can think about how the, the finite sum should drop off to, to get the best approximations and, and so on. And here again, as a reminder, uh, this is just the four component uh, approximate version of a grid state with a Gaussian envelope. So how can I create these states now? Uh, first, I create a squeeze state. This I do with our favorite uh, technique, uh, which is called reservoir engineering, and you can read up about it in, in the, this paper. So it's, actually, it's like sideband cooling, but just into a squeeze state. And we can do it with high fidelity and quite robust. Then I just perform one of these modular measurements. This splits me up in a two-state superposition. Um, I post-select the dark outcome, because in the other case, uh, my state is uh, destroyed. And I just go on. I do a, a next modular measurement, for example, this one, um, where I get, for example, this three-component superposition. And I guess this is the smallest state, which we can kind of call a GKP state. Um, but I can also vary, I could do another round or vary here the displacement to be double to get four components and so on. Still, before I show you some data, how can I now read out this created uh, GKP state? Because I can only read out my internal qubit and not my emotional qubit so well. To see this best, um, we can look at the Pauli operations. And the Pauli X operation is quite easy to see from, from the decode states. It's simply shifting that code state by half its periodicity in phase space. So it's, it's a displacement operator in phase space. If we would rewrite uh, the GKP state in the momentum basis, then we would equally as easy see that the, the set gate is just shifting the state up um, in phase space. And the Y gate is then closing uh, this triangle and is also a displacement. So I read out now the state by uh, doing the corresponding modular measurement of this Pauli operation. What do I mean by that? Instead of displacing in phase space, I again pull apart into, um, I separate into two uh, copies and pull them apart. So let's look at the set readout. So I take the state, I pull it apart along the set direction with the separation corresponding to, to the Pauli operator. Um, if I now want to think about what happens to my internal state, I get a formula, if I try to do it analytically, where I would plug in the grid state here. It gets a lot of terms, a, a large sum. And the, whether these, these terms add up construct, constructively or destructively depends now on geometric phases. Since this is such a regular um, grid, the, the relative phases between these, these uh, squeeze parts, which still overlap, and these are the relevant phases, uh, will always be, no matter where I'm at in my grid, a multiple of 2 pi, and this leads to a constructive sum up here. While if I do the same for the one state, I pull it apart with the right distance, look at the phases, then this additional shift exactly gives me an additional pi, um, and I can read out the qubit in the other level. So this really allows to copy the grid state qubit back into my internal level state qubit. To find out a bit more about uh, my states, I'm not only uh, measuring at this particular distance corresponding to the approximate Pauli readout, which is indicated by this red line in, in the plots. Um, I'm varying the displacement uh, continuously along this, these directions. So here is now some sample data. I created these three component grid states um, with like roughly 8 dB of squeezing of this uh, initial uh, squeeze state. This gives like, I try to calculate it in real distances. It's like RMS size elongated is like 20 and the, the thinner axis is like 3.3. And I choose like the symmetric encoding, so this means a separation in phase space of roughly 2.5, which would be like 40 nanometers. Um, so if you now pull this state apart along the x-axis, so along, the, along this axis, uh, we will find revivals whenever these neighbors overlap, and that's exactly the revival one sees here. And there is a second uh, re smaller revival when the furthest out part overlap. The Pauli readout 
would be along this, this line. And since the zero is uh, an equal superposition, we find here 0 0.5 probability. If we now look at the set readout, uh, we see double the frequencies of revival. This comes from the geometric phases. And exactly at the, the spot where we read out the set operator, uh, we get the positive revival. And if we calculate back as an expectation of this observable, it's roughly uh, 0 0.75. The solid lines here represent really the analytic calculation of, of this measurement, so not including any kind of decoherence in my system. So I'm still reasonably close to, to this perfect experiment. I can displace this prepared state additionally um, in phase space, so I get uh, this state, and do the same analysis. So the, the X analysis doesn't care where the state is in, in phase space, so it looks totally the same. But now, um, really, the set readout works because this additional shift makes this revival to change its direction. And here is now the expectation value is roughly minus 0 0.78. Um, the second revival here, which is always positive, would actually correspond to the a measurement of these stabilizers. I can now play uh, with these states, find I better squeezing or what works best in my experiment, and I'm currently doing this. Here is just shown as another example, doing an equal weighted four component superposition. I explained to you how I can do the, the Pauli operations, but actually I would do, like to do the full set of uh, single qubit operations. So far, I, I, no very clever scheme for, for this came to my mind, but I have uh, one which works probabilistically, so I, I again need an additional detection, and if I'm dark, I, I created uh, the rotation I wanted. This really, in this scheme, I really create first an encoded state and then add up with a certain proportion and, and relative phase uh, the other logical state. So if I start from a three component state, I end up really with six components in phase space. And if I then analyze them now here in, along all the three directions, um, I, need, I get like 12 components which partially overlap and the readout relies on the interference of these 12 components. Um, I just tried that. I was not sure whether my lines would turn out totally flat, but I was actually quite happy. I tried it on just two pi half pulses. I created zero plus one and zero plus I1. Um, I can see here at larger displacements some discrepancies, but I think it's still very nice. If I create zero plus one, uh, I get the revival at x. I really get nothing at z and nothing at y. If I create zero plus I1, this looks totally different. Uh, 0 0.5, as I expected. Here also, 0 0.5. And here I get this, this revival at Y. And the Y direction is really pulling these, these six components diagonally apart and letting them still interfere. So with this, I like to summarize. Um, we have seen how modular position and momentum uh, can commute and how we can find out about it experimentally. We have quickly looked at how we can use these measurements to find out about the quantum to classical transition. And in the end, I showed you how we can uh, create a toy, toy grid, grid states uh, to play with. Um, since this is an error correction conference, I wanted to have a slide on error correction. It's quite clear what's the problem in, in, in my system is this readout, which in, in the case of bright results, destroys my nice uh, motionless state. Still, I was wondering uh, whether I could do some qualitative demonstration of some error correction. Um, so I had some ideas. They are all a bit crazy and a bit harder. Um, so one was, for example, my qubit is not simply just two levels. There would be many levels around it. So that's roughly how the relevant uh, qubit levels look like. And I'm already playing with actually a Q-trit. And we set up an, another laser here. So if I have like four levels available, may, maybe I might squeeze more information in these four levels and get more information with one readout or something like that. But basically, I don't know. So I'm very happy if somebody likes to discuss and give me some more ideas. Um, 
yeah, with this, I'd like to thank all my group. It's really a pleasure with working with them, and especially the people who work on the same experimental set setup, like Matteo, you, you could meet before, and also Tan Long, who joined uh, my kind of branch of measurements. Questions? 